The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the hosts and guests as individuals, and do not necessarily reflect those of advertisers or sponsors. This show is intended as education and commentary only. The producers strive for very similitude, but nothing said on this podcast should be taken as fact by the listener or viewer without performing due diligence. While generally safe for work, some language may be considered offensive by more sensitive viewers or listeners. All right. Cans on. Mic's up. Level's good. You got me over there? All right. Let's roll. This is Booth to Booth, your direct line to the latest in home voiceover production. With your favorite home VO experts throughout the industry, across the internet, and all around the world. Booth to Booth is brought to you by the Narrowband Broadcast Network, NBBN. The focus is on you. By Andrew Scott Media, making your media matter. By Booth Stuff, unique VO fashion and swag that's as loud and proud as you are. And by the kind support of our viewers and listeners all around the world via Kofi. Kofi, helping you give back to the creators that help you the most. The session clock is running and all the mics are hot. So let's patch in and get this session started. Here's your host, VO coach, narrator, and producer, Andrew Scott. And hello and welcome back to Booth to Booth, the show where, hell, we talk about talking. I'm Andrew Scott, and today I am thrilled to have somebody who we've been going back and forth for the better part of a half a year, but I am talking to Morgan Bailey Keaton. And um, Morgan, we're just jumping right in. I want to know your origin story. I want to know how you got into this nutty world and how you got into that box that you're currently sitting in. So kind of get us up to speed on you and where you came from. Yeah, thanks so much for having me um, after all this time. Right, so yeah, well. I... <laughs> So my dad was a jazz DJ, actually, and it took me a long time to recognize that that was really part of this journey. Ah. Um, I recorded radio shows on my little pre, uh, like play school tape recorder with my friends. Didn't think much of it. Always knew I wanted to do something creative, and I was fortunate enough to get into an extracurricular um, acting conservatory okay. for about 10 years of my childhood. So this stuff is very ingrained in me. Yeah. Acting. Um, did some stage management, et cetera. I thought I wanted to do stage. And then um, I got out of high school, had this kind of aha moment watching Looney Tunes one day. And I was like, you know what? I think that's it. <laughs> I think that's what I'm supposed to be doing. So um long story short, I picked up and moved out to LA. And since I've been here, I have uh, I've acted for all kinds of things. I've cast, I've directed, I've produced, I've been production coordinator, I've worked in subtitling, dubbing, like I've had quite the journey right and um, here we are. And uh, are you still, do you step on the stage at all anymore or is that really something Boy. that's just kind of informed where you are now? I would love to get back on stage. I do not at this point. Um, it's it's difficult. I mean, it's, it's, it is the audio books of of in-person acting yeah, it is. where you do it for the love of it, not because it pays anything a lot of the time. Yeah, frankly. So someday when I'm a little, you know, when I, when, when I am feeling more secure, then I will go and throw a bunch of my time. There you go. Sure. You know, what you just said kind of brings up something to me that I've been uh, dealing with, with some of my coaching clients and other things. And that is this idea of when you feel secure enough to take that next step. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it's not that we coined the term, but you hear the term imposter syndrome in voiceover mm. All the time. And I keep mm -hmm. telling people, you know, I've been doing this full time for about a decade and mm -hmm. off and on for 35 years. And I pretty much still feel it on a daily basis. There's always mm -hmm. something in my head that goes, do you do you even know what you're doing? Why? Why are you doing this? Um, mm -hmm. You know, your reference to it really kind of it, it should cement in people's mind this idea that we can be extraordinarily talented people. We can very be a very accomplished person in our chosen path, and we still kind of question whether or not we have what it takes. Is there something in your past that 
finally made you go, no, I, I can do this. I, I really can. What was like the, the thing that kind of finally mm-hmm. let you know that, no, I'm, I'm on the right path. I might not feel wholly confident, but I know mm-hmm. I'm going in the right direction. Sure. Um, and I do have an answer for that. I do want to clarify as well. I mean, so much of it comes to financial security. Yeah, I was going to say that that's the other side of security, too. It's not always sure. what we feel about ourselves. It's that I got to keep the lights on in this place. I've got a family yeah. to take care of, and I might have to juggle two, three, four, five, nine things. Right. And and we haven't mentioned, I, I live in Los Angeles. My rent is Oof. very expensive. Living here is very expensive. Gas is expensive. And so that is much more where my mind goes. With that said, getting back on stage, I don't think I've done a play since, you know, in, in 10 years. Mm. So I would be feeling some of this trepidation, as you're saying. And honestly, this wasn't even a conscious choice that I made. But what really helped me to kick imposter syndrome was time. And stepping away from from acting at different times. Really, um, there was, and and again, the stepping away from acting was not a, a choice that I made. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first went, a part that I glossed over in my origin story um, was that I originally went to a school in New York City for stage management, thinking that eventually I'd be able to get back into acting. And it was the first time in my very young life that I had ever not been acting. It was the first time in over 10 years that I had not been acting. And so that stepping away and then coming back and realizing and and hearing it more, hearing myself perform more objectively was what allowed me to hear myself and go, Oh yeah, I'm no I'm good at this. I remember that. You know, it's so easy on the day to day to day to day to day when you keep hearing the same stuff and listening back to your auditions and and just losing that objectivity. Yeah. Taking that space away really allowed me to come back and say, "Hey, I'm pretty good." And similarly, listening back to old auditions, um, you know, when I've been fishing around for what am I going to put on my demo sure. or whatever. Mm-hmm. Listening back I'm like, "Hey, that was pretty good." Was yeah, yeah, wow. Wow. <laughs> hire her. Um, exactly, yeah. I, you know, I'm really encouraged to hear your optics on this because um, there, there's been times where with, with certain other, I guess we'll say visible or notable uh, VO educators, uh, where it, it's not that they called me on it, but it's kind of like they said, well, that's why you are where you are. Not even being fully familiar with where I am because I'm doing okay. Yeah. Uh, but well, this yeah. idea of the grind of, Mm -hmm. of, you know, of, of wake and take, as I jokingly refer to it, where you Mm -hmm. just get up and immediately get in the booth. Um, and, uh, you know, I always encourage people, even if you feel like you are in a groove, step away for a bit, go focus somewhere else for just Mm -hmm. a little bit because of exactly what you said. That's the only way that you can come back with some sense of objective eyes or, more importantly, ears. Mm -hmm. You spend even so much as an hour listening to your own voice. Mm -hmm. At about the 10-minute mark, it just turns into the wah-wah-wah. And you don't have the ability to hear really significant things. I personally, if I'm doing more than about a half hour, 45 minutes worth of edit work, I start losing the ability to hear sibilance and I'm mm-hmm. a terribly sibilant person. So I will normally at the end of a take, I will get up, walk away, have the cat ignore me or beg for food, um, and then come back in and go, oh, I need to put a de on that mm-hmm. thing. I am just putting needles in my ears. Mm-hmm. But more than that, I think that it, it, every single person who wants to get in VO or every single person who is in VO owes it to themselves and their career to step away for a little while and come back in with an objective view towards their business and their VO practice and their artistry and their skill level. If you mm-hmm. stay down in those trenches, the only thing you see is the trench. You don't mm-hmm. see the sky. You don't see the, the, the field in front of you. And you can't mm-hmm. make solid decisions if you're that myopic. So mm-hmm. I'm really encouraged to hear your approach to that. Sure. One of the things, of course, that we are going to delve into a little bit more uh, after the first break is um, where you first became visible to me, and that is looping. Uh, this, this, this thing that certain VO people do, 
that um, I, I don't think is an, is quite on people's radar the way other aspects of VOR, like promo or audiobooks. Because it's the mafia. Right, exactly. Exactly. It's, it's la cosa nostra, this thing we do, kind of. Mm-hmm. In a nutshell, explain to people what looping is. So looping is also known as ADR, and I won't even bother telling you what those letters stand for because no one agrees. Right. Um, but those are, those are synonymous. Automated, and, automatic, what, yeah. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Whatever, you know, it's it's what it is at this point. Yeah. Um, and you'll also see Walla even um, sort of grouped in, in w- with those terms because mm-hmm. those are all things that are part of looping as the greater umbrella category. So looping, which is a term I will explain quickly because I think that will help, comes from the age of film. And they would grab um, something that for some reason the audio needed to get replaced on after being filmed. Right. Um, either there was, you know, somebody dropped a piece of equipment or there was a helicopter going by or the actor flubbed, but the rest of the take was great, whatever mm-hmm. it is. They would take a piece of that film and put it on a loop. Yeah, they would physically, it, this is it. back in the day where this back was, yeah, day. you know, and they would cut it and they would put it on an infinite loop spool so it could be played over and over again. And so they would record audio and the actor would jump in at the right time. You know, they would either have a visual indicator or beeps going beep, beep. And then you go on the on the imaginal, Im- imaginary fourth beep. Right. So for, for a looping, when we're talking about this category, there are two main things that go into this. One is the, the dialogue replacement, which is the potentially the DR of the right. ADR term I mentioned earlier. And again, that is where... So there was some issue during filming. There was some issue with even the file. It got corrupted or they need to change a word for the airplane version right. of, the, of the project, whatever mm. the reason may be. And so it's all of that. Plus, the original actor is not available. Mm-hmm. It's still looping when the original actor does it, but we're not concerned about that because none of us probably are in the on-camera world. Right. So. You know, if Dwayne The Rock Johnson is available for his ADR, then he will go do it. Otherwise, we have loop groups and looping, which provides the jobs to find someone who sounds dead up yeah, like Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who can come up and replace that line, those lines, those words, whatever it may be. Even efforts. I mean, you'll if, if you look at um, combat scenes, really physical things, horror movies where people are screaming, sometimes these actors sign clauses where they say, I'm not going to do that, yeah. or I'm not physically capable of doing that. Yeah, no efforts. And yeah, for, for my listeners and viewers, uh, it, it, it's, it's VO speak. An effort is a grunt or a sigh or some other non-word related acoustic element made by one of the actors in a film. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, it's funny that you bring up uh, Dwayne Johnson. Uh, there is so much good material of Dwayne at the mic mm-hmm. um, doing these things. And I mm-hmm. encourage everybody out there, go look at it because I will, uh, this is a hill I'll die on. Dwayne Johnson gets an, an immense amount of my respect as a voice actor. And if you watch the way he actually addresses the mic, you know he's conscious of what he's doing. This is not my physical acting. My muscles don't matter here. I need to pay attention to that microphone. I need to act to that microphone. And it's an absolute mm-hmm. delight watching him do his work on microphone. It, it makes mm-hmm. me feel very seen in one way and, of course, very, very puny and <laughs> and and small in another. Uh, I tell you sure. what, we're going to jump to a quick break. We will come back and we're going to be diving in more deeply to things like looping and all other sorts of good stuff. But until we get back, I'm Andrew Scott. That is Morgan Bailey Keaton. This is the Narrow Band Broadcast Network, and this is my little show here about VO. We'll get back to Booth to Booth in just a second. Don't go anywhere. Bye. God, I love being able to edit out. Booth to Booth is brought to you in part by Bootstuff.com, the home of the world's most unique VO casual fashion and swag. You know, this thing that we do is pretty unique. So... Slap on a Booth Stuff t-shirt that tells the world, or, you know, your cat, that being in a tiny room by yourself is where you truly belong. Shirts, hats, pants, mugs, and more. Well, not a lot more. 
Actually, that's pretty much it. Anyway, Booth Stuff is the one and only home for VO-centric swag that lets the world know what you do with that mouth of yours. So, head on over to BoothStuff.com and get something that shows the world who you are and what you love to do. BoothStuff.com. Loud and proud. And hello and welcome back to Booth to Booth. I am Andrew Scott, of course, and today I am talking with Morgan Bailey Keaton. See, I got it right this time. It just flowed off the tongue. Uh, there's plenty of junk on the cutting room floor of this episode. So, um, But Morgan, before we move on to other things, uh, before the break, we were talking about looping. Yes. And I want you to kind of finish up a little bit about that. And we do have some questions uh, from the Booth Camp Discord server uh, specifically about looping. So yes. press on. Cliffhangers are how, are how we right. keep people, keep keep the eyeballs. Exactly there. right. So um, we talked about, about uh, replacing dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. which is the looping of this. However, if we're talking about loop groups, um, yes. which I think that term is probably self-explanatory, a bunch of people who mm -hmm. all do looping, there's also Walla, which is part of that. And so you mm -hmm. do need for that, for, for, for l replacing dialogue, you need a really good ear to be able to place yourself as that person in that place at that yeah, in that, in that scene. Exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <clears throat> in their motivation, etc. Because mm -hmm. they're acting in a way that you probably would not choose to do. Right. But then also with Walla, you need to be able to improvise significantly well. And with and what does Walla what does Walla actually kind of stand for? Well, so Walla is an onomatopoeia. If you've got mm -hmm. a bunch of people in a room and all and they had them all just say walla 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 it basically walla, achieves walla, the concept, walla, 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 walla. which yes. is which is to create the background chatter for a given yeah. scene like if Nat if, and natural background chatter exactly. not not the wilhelm scream kind of you know everybody's <laughs> taking the 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 coffee house background from the no it's there's something about walla that the subconscious mind registers as authentic and real mm -hmm. and that's why walla is actually something that i i don't think maybe 999 out of out of a thousand voice actors even know that walla is a thing mm -hmm. yeah and what people don't know i mean having uh, having directed a dub recently where there's a lot of walla as well because you can imagine if we didn't replace the background chatter in, say, a Korean or a Japanese show, and you heard this background chatter, you'd be, the viewers would be a little confused. I heard that dude say pastrami. <laughs> that's not. That's not right. So yeah, it all needs to be incredibly bespoke and custom, and yes. you need to take the scene and the the universe. You need to take all that into consideration when you're doing Walla. Right, and and just to give an ultra short super quick crash course to Walla under any circumstance. One, you are matching the tone of that scene. If 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 the action of that scene, which you will watch before you jump in, or and if the score of that scene, if it's kind of bittersweet, you don't want to be like, ha 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 ha, what a great <laughs> right? time we're having. You want to yeah. be like, oh, you only got a B on the test? That's too bad. Mm -hmm. You know, like you wanna you want to more morph into the tone of that scene. You want to include plot relevant details and world details. If the if the scene is set in Michigan, you probably beforehand should look up some towns in Michigan, yeah. some intersections that you would talk about, some chains that are popular there. You don't want to talk about politics or anything that's that's sensitive. You probably don't want to mention any religion, which includes saying, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. And you want to ask about cursing beforehand. Like those yes. are those are the big five things that you want to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Um for for a good Walla sesh, and then otherwise you can and, learn on the job. Yeah, and there are there are a couple things that I experienced. I've done Walla a little bit uh, about six or seven years ago. I was involved in two three projects. Uh, two of them were student films that needed Walla, and they just kind of went on Reddit and said, "We don't know what we're doing. We'd mm -hmm. love it if we had some people who knew about mm -hmm. this to teach us because we've been told we need this." Mm -hmm. um, you know, some directors, some some you know directors will give you will say, "Well, I tell you what. Here's just a little. Here's just a little outline of a discussion." You guys riff this discussion. Mm -hmm. Some will actually give you 
certain words, as you indicated, will give you certain words yeah. that they want to have heard in the background. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things that is, I know some people include this in Walla in their direction for Walla and some people don't. And that is, um, if the scene, uh, like for example, this, one of the scenes that I was, uh, that I was involved with was a very tense confrontation took place between primary actor and secondary actor in the scene. Mm -hmm. And they needed the, they needed the Walla to screech to a halt mm -hmm. and to go down to like this tense whisper kind of murmur, murmur thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And so sometimes they'll do that. They will give you a time marker, say, you know, they'll, they'll clap you in. And at 13 seconds, we want you to go silent or mm -hmm. we want you to go down to a whisper. Mm -hmm. Some won't, some will record additional walla. That's just for that portion where they'll get three seconds of walla and then down to a murmur so that mm -hmm. they can paste it together. Mm -hmm. But those things do at times get thrown as at you as a voice actor, a looper, and a walla person. And it's a little bit different it, from project to project, right? 100%, absolutely. And it's different even from, from genre to genre or what group you're working with. You know, as a, um, we call them wranglers or coordinators, the people who are leading the group and finding work for the group. Um, I will be in the room with the group, which means that we are all recording at the same time. Yeah, and most so Walla, uh, except for some that was done uh, during lockdown, uh, the vast majority of Walla is done in person. Everybody's standing around three or four mics. Right, for same language projects where we're doing, right. you know, where the project is already in English, et cetera. Dubbing is a different thing, and we can, mm -hmm. we can talk about that. Um I mean specifically if the Wrangler is going to be in the room doing the Walla with you or not. They may be in the mm -hmm. booth where they're going to be harder to see. There may be a glare on the window. You know, maybe right. you can't communicate as well. Um, if that's the case, uh, re regardless of if the Wrangler is in or out of the room, somebody usually has the cans on, has the headphones on so that they can mm -hmm. communicate with the control room. Some sometimes you'll receive a cue that way. And right. whoever's wearing the cans or the Wrangler will say, okay, everybody, now is when we bring it down. Um, but the the interesting thing is that, you know, sometimes you're going to get a visual visual cue from someone in the room. Sometimes you're mm -hmm. going to get a cue from looking at the time code in the right. monitor. Sometimes you're going to be looking for something that happens in the action of the scene. Mm -hmm. um, it all kind of at the, at the yeah, at the most inelegant of times, you'll hear an audio cue when somebody has to get on the talk back feature and grind the whole thing to a halt <laughs> because no, nah, this isn't kind of what we're you guys are sounding and sounding a little too happy. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, because I've only done Walla in person once about 10 years ago mm -hmm. here in town where I am. Uh, but this sends us into the the other realm, and that is you are you have just recently completed your directorial debut yes. on a wonderful project and i would like you to tell us a little bit about the project and sort of the genesis of how you landed this thing oh boy i don't think you yeah. know this story um no i don't that's why i'm asking <laughs> screw the audience dish i want to know what's going on yeah well this just goes to show i mean i i continuously say if you look through my my reddit comment feed or my twitter or whatever presence that i have anywhere i consistently say and enforce that there is no one path to anything right. um, in, in this industry. And you just have to take that at face value. <laughs> yeah, it's it, there is one path. It's the squiggliest line you can draw. And there are many branches that mm -hmm. come off of it. And some lead to dead ends. And some that you think are dead ends are like, oh, my God, this is my mm -hmm. career now. So yeah. absolutely in agreement. A hundred percent. So I would say the shortest version that I can tell of this, I, I knew that I wanted to do to direct and to cast. And I have done some of that, including mm -hmm. the looping work that I've done. Um, never to a significant degree, never to a very visible degree. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I had some uh, some background there. I also interned at Nickelodeon's uh, talent and casting department for their animation division. Um, okay. So that didn't hurt. That was very <laughs> I was just going to say, if you were if you if you cut your teeth hurting kids, uh, you know, hurting <laughs> adults is probably harder because uh, we're more easily distractible. There were very phones few kids up. around. I was working yeah. with the adults. Um, Interesting, but uh, I mean, because you know, like Tara Strong and all them coming through. Kevin uh, Michael sure, Richardson. Yeah, 
You know. Oh, yeah. So many people who are placed in the VO industry now, yeah, they all cut their teeth way back then mm-hmm. at Nickelodeon because mm-hmm. Nickelodeon was, you know, between Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network back in that day, those were the two titans that were putting out this relevant content mm-hmm. that has been adapted and kept alive so many times in things that require audio production. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So so those those... They may, you know, in, in an imposter syndrome sort of brain, I could look at that, that stuff and be like, that is totally irrelevant. It's not valuable. Right. It is, though. It is. It's a, it's a brick in your foundation. It is. Um, so that was undoubtedly part of it. The other thing that happened was um, I worked at a company called Deluxe for a while. I worked in subtitling and then I was working in scripting. And the scripts that I was making for this job were very similar to scripts that we write for dubs called adaptations um, right. or writing for ADR. Yeah. And so I was doing that full time, English to English, um, but making notes for translators so that they know sort of how to treat things, um, different, mm-hmm. you know, idioms uh, and phrases that we use. Right. Colloquialisms and all that business. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. It was great. Um, it was great experience. And so um, a friend of mine uh, who, directs dubs and now video games. He talked to me. He knew that I was leaving that job. And he said, you know, I think you'd be really good at writing these adaptations for dubs. It's basically exactly what you're doing, just a little bit different. Even the software that I'm using is very similar. Um, And so I got my first job January of 2020. (laughs) uh timely yeah held me <laughs> over through through the pandemic um i wrote really concentrating concentratedly full time for about 2 years developed relationships with a lot of different studios one of them being ayuno formerly known as ayuno sdi ayuno or SDI, sdi mergers yeah. etc right and so um this same friend who recommended me for the adaptation work said to me, hey, Morgan, there's a studio that needs a director for a dub. I know you don't have experience here, but they don't have anyone else. And I would put your name in, I would throw your name into the hat with full confidence. Would you be interested in? I didn't end up getting that job. They worked Mm -hmm. it out uh, elsewhere, like in other ways. But it shattered the illusion for me. I had always thought that the way I would get into directing was by being a much more established actor, by acting for Cartoon Network and, and Nickelodeon and Blizzard and all these or big crunchy companies. roll and all that business. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, all these big companies. And then being able to have a one to one conversation either with these studios or producers or other directors and say, hey, you already know me. Can I get in? Right. Him recommending me <clears throat> for yeah, this you, you job. Su- you su- yeah, you suddenly had an industry champion. I did. I did. And, and someone had told me, you are worthy and capable of doing this now. Having, having someone uh, fight for me in that way, this person has really been um, a champion of mine and, and finding different opportunities for me made me realize, you know what? I'm going to send an email to Ayuno and be like, hey, we cool. Like, can yeah. I do this other kind of work? And they were like, yeah, okay. Yeah, and it's all because you might have been doubting yourself, but somebody uh, on the same tier or a rung above said, um, you can doubt yourself all you want. I have absolutely no doubts about you. Mm-hmm. So you need to be going in this direction. And if you don't, I'm going to be behind you shoving you that mm-hmm. way. So yeah. how, how it can't get better than that. I, I'm very, very lucky for that because, um, I, and I'm, I'm a testament to this. It is very difficult to be that person for yourself over and over and over and over. At some point, it starts feeling like, why am I the only one championing myself? Yeah. And unfortunately, that just is the reality most of the time. Mm-hmm. However, utilize your network. You know, this this is why this is God, why yes. we get to know people. And most importantly, my thing with ne- networking is. Don't go to the power source. If you single no. out the person in the room at the networking event or at the Zoom hang or whatever, who has the most connections, is doing the stuff that you want to do, and you focus directly on them, it will backfire. You're will- going to be considered that guy or that girl in that equation. The one, no, it's just talk, talk, to, talk to people a little bit further down and establish your rapport with them because they're going to radio you 
to the person in control. And then if that happens, you've already essentially been soft vetted by that mm. community. And man, that gets you a lot farther, a lot faster than, oh, sure. I'm going to be so ballsy as to. Sure. I mean, I would even take it in a, di in a different direction from that. I wouldn't disagree with that. However, I would say my approach is still a little different where, mm -hmm. you know, go straight to that person if you are vibing with that person. My oh, whole thing, sure. what has served me very well, and, and admittedly, we're in the age of the of the introvert in in voiceover, and I say that neutrally. I don't say that with any negative connotation, and I say that with full knowledge, knowing that most of the time I'm pretty extroverted. So, you know, some things may be easier for me. However, what I have found serves me the most over my, you know, fifteen year career, is just spending time with the people I vibe with and yeah. get along with. Because when I first met this man who has championed my career. He was an actor like me. He wasn't directing. He wasn't doing all these other things. We just kept in touch because we liked each other. Um, and so if you keep focusing on how do I climb, how do I climb, how do I climb, that is just going to blow up in your face. Focus on the people who you jive with and take it from there. I think, you know, we might, or I might, because I'm the producer, hi, uh, we, we might wind up calling this episode of Booth to Booth about connections mm. because i think that there's a there's a bad there's a bad smell around connections mm -hmm. and i think it's legacy from back in back in the old days where connections mean nepotism that i don't I, I not only do I not think that's true, I think that is patently false. It can be obviously, but at the same time as you just said, if you don't if you aren't swimming with the fish that you want to be counted as a part of, you know, the fish isn't going to jump out of the pond and come talk to you. That's not how it works. So you need to be in community. You need to be in connection with the world that you want to be a part of. And uh, I'm like you in that, you know, even in my downtimes as a full-time professional, there are times where I didn't have to do that grind. I didn't have to hustle for work because the work was literally finding me. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't finding me because of my website. It wasn't finding me because of my social media push mm -hmm. or anything like that. It was finding me because I did a job for a guy who now is in touch with a girl who's looking for a thing that I don't actually do, mm -hmm. but I did this one thing. And so on and on and on. And before you know it, I'm sending invoices. <laughs> and <laughs> that is a fantastic feeling. Feeling. And it is it is one of those points of career validation that feel like nothing else mm -hmm. that that it, it's almost right up there with the feeling of getting your first check. Mm -hmm. It is. Wow. People are coming to me. This isn't a huge thing, but it, it came to me. I didn't have to do anything but the work. Mm -hmm. And it's all because I just really enjoyed talking with this one person at an event or in a, a Zoom breakout or something. And as you said, we vibed with each other and we stayed in touch with each other. And now, boom, here I am. So getting into community is still one of the things. I just beat that drum to the point where it's broken. Get in with a community, either, you know, uh, Discord, you can join, uh, you know, mm -hmm. my link to my Discord is down in the bottom. Um, you know, getting on Reddit, although I'm here to say as a Reddit moderator, we're supporting the blackout against Reddit right now. We want to fight for positive change because Reddit is such a huge resource mm -hmm. for community when it comes to voiceover. Um, get into those groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I want to jump to now, though, is something <clears throat> that is particular to looping that I want your thoughts on. Um, due to the, the nature of looping, where it's literally looping around and you're doing it over and over again, and generally speaking, you are an actor voicing another actor. What is, in your mind, the importance of having a good skill at mimicry, uh, mm. you know, kind of wherever and, and however, because, you know, I'll tip my hand. I beat my students to death about mimicry because I think it is one of the greatest tools to get moving faster in voiceover. If you know what right sounds like and you can mimic what right sounds like, mm -hmm. not only will you get more jobs, but you are immensely more directable. 
and people like that. So what are your thoughts on mimicry and what is your experience with really being able to spend time with a voice that you have to recreate and mm-hmm. how it works for you in that way? Mm-hmm. So so mimicry, I would say it, 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 in, it, there are two pieces to my response. One is the more um, technical aspect of it, of can you mimic and create the voice that you are trying to loop? You mean tonally? Yeah. By way of vo- vocal character. Exactly, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then and then the other piece would be can you get yourself basically into their body to, you mm-hmm. know, get the performance where it needs to be? Can you understand what their motivation is, what they're feeling, etc.? And I have found this time and time again. I mean, to ignore being able to to mimic and be flexible about your performance is to not be very competitive and voiceover. The, you know, there will be times in probably every session that you have, in probably every session that you have, that the director or the client, the producer, is going to ask you, can you do it more like blah, blah? Yep. And you're going to be thinking to yourself, that sounds stupid and cheesy. I don't want to do that. You're going to be thinking, that doesn't make sense to me that the character would be doing this. You're going to be yeah. thinking any number of things that disagrees with them. And yet, you're not the one writing yourself the check, are you? Correct. <laughs> you know, you're brought in to do a service, and ego is a whole other thing yeah. that would take us another hour to, to with talk. With the cans on is not the time to be standing there going, but what about my art? You know, I, no, you're not being paid for your art. You're being paid for your skill. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Can you do it this way? Undeniably. You do have some integrity as a performer. I am sure. not going to say that that is not the case. And it does matter because your name is going to be on your performance. It can be really difficult. I found an old video game performance that I did over 10 years ago. And I went and listened back to it. And I'm like, what was the director asking me to do? <laughs> <laughs> uh, even with that objectivity we were talking about, I was like, right. this is rough. Um, and yeah. luckily it wasn't very popular, but had it been, you know, it might've been a little rough for me. So undeniably ego, ego is there. However, defer to the client, defer to the client. And so, you know, mimicry, as uh, 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 the term that you're using here, is how you allow yourself to get into that, where you reverse engineer. Okay, Mm -hmm. they're asking me to be super peppy about it being Valentine's Day, right? Right. They want me to be super smiley, super what sounds to me like cheesy, but they want me to be really smiley. How do I get myself there? You're not just going to put it on because it's not going to sound authentic. So how do I reverse engineer in my brain? What about it? There's definitely a time in my life when I sound that happy, that cheesy, authentically. What is going to get me there in my actor brain to be able to produce an organic and authentic performance for them? So that would be my response to that um, for why mimicry is important, because the director is going to ask you to do something that you are not expecting to do and they, that obviously does not come naturally to you, other th- otherwise they probably would not have taking you in a different direction. Right. And they're not, I think the misconception is that they're, when they do that, when a director is doing that, they're not asking you to do that character. What they're doing is they're giving you a character reference that points to things like energy level, um, tone, sometimes things like disfluencies, uh, you know, where uh, I, there's been a couple times where I've been told, can you kind of give me a Matthew McConaughey thing? And of course, that means that we're going to be going down to here and, you know, mm-hmm. kind of thing. So, So it's not that they want you to be somebody else, and it's not that Mm -hmm. they want you to step away from what they're asking for. What they're doing is is they're giving you a character reference to help you dial that read in. Mm -hmm. And that's where I find that a strong mimic muscle really helps, because now if you do that, you start building up a, a... Uh, essentially a character library and a character reference language Mm -hmm. that will make you more directable more easily. And if a director falls in love with you, if a director feels, wow, that was just like the most effortless thing, which by the way, kids, there's virtually no effortless video take ever. (laughs) Um, But if you really jive with the director and you make it easy for them to be able to shape you and direct and, and mold that read 
you're gonna get called back. Sure, sure. Guaranteed. Sure. And and before before I get to the more technical aspects of how you're changing your voice to you know get yourself in the body of whoever you need to be in. Um, the other thing I would say too, just, just to validate, because I know how difficult, you know, I'm on both sides of the glass. I'm on both sides of agencies, um, as, as a casting director and as a voice director. So it's easier for me to say, let me just tell you from my side of the glass as a director, a lot of the time when we are asking you to do something, it's because we heard something in your performance that we liked yep. and we, and we are inspired by your performance and what you're bringing to the table. And we want to draw that out. Even we're more. less, we're being less critical than we are actually trying to bring up good right. things that we heard. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and even if you get something that is absolutely feels out of left field, so different from what you're doing, I will just leave it at. You don't know what the director's motivation is. They could be doing one of their, you know, some of their director trickery to get some other, you know, <laughs> some other reaction out of you or put you in a certain state of mind, whatever and it may that, be. That's a, that's a real thing. Sometimes you're right. It is. It is. Um, and I would say that that happens much more in classes where it's a safe space to really experiment. But agreed. Just to say out loud, because I, I don't think that performance hear, performers hear it enough, when you are being directed, just coach yourself through that moment and don't take it as critical or as, no. um, as you are failing. Take it as a yes and, right? Right. Um, the other thing that I would say as far as, um, as getting in the voice of the character, if we're talking specifically about looping still, the the mimicry of you know if you're watching a show and there's a really cool creature making an odd you know like it's got an interesting voice print you can hear the physicality even though it's voiceover mm -hmm. you know taking a moment to to stop to pause it to think what about this do i like how are they doing this why are they doing this how is it making me feel and then trying to recreate that on your own that's just a taking the end part is taking a stab at it yourself mm -hmm. kind of in real time while it's fresh mm -hmm. and while all those machinations are right in your head i find that to be a very powerful tool because i'll take a stab and i'll go okay that's nowhere close which indicates to me that if i would want to include that in something i'd need to practice more or the uh you know on the other hand going Oh wow! Uh, apparently, I can do that now. I better remember that and maybe stick that in right. a demo or something so I can demonstrate it. And even if you you end up a league away from the original performance you're mimicking, you may still end up somewhere that you never would have found before. You know, hey, that's yeah. cool. Let me hang on to that. Yeah. So you know, it's one thing to sound exactly like Sarah Michelle Geller and go in and do a loop of of her in whatever movie she's in, but it's another thing to be able to be her to keep that voice print and also what does that voice print sound like when she's scared or when she's frazzled when she loves somebody when mm -hmm. she's scared and running and fighting you know you have to be able to again reverse engineer to get yourself in that place yeah and uh, again completely agreed and it also points to you don't know until you try and you should, as a aspiring voice actor or a working voice actor, um, you should be ready to throw yourself at something new any time of day or night mm -hmm. just to experience it. If you keep on thinking about stuff or worrying about stuff, it, you just it's analysis paralysis and you mm -hmm. never progress. Just do the thing. Try it. Start doing it and see what happens. If yeah. it's not your jam, you file it away. If it is your jam, now you got something new. And you never so, know what they're going to ask you to do in a no, session either. I have, I have a character coming out in a video game um, by the time this airs, uh, so NDA not violated. Uh, right, right. And I'm literally a raven. They, they, <laughs> All <laughs> they, right. just, they just threw it at me and they're like, you know, I was expecting her to just be the human form. And then I came into session one day and the script was her as a raven. And I'm like calling <laughs> and thank God, I spent so many hours in my closet just like inhaling speech and making different sounds and adding vocal fry and stuff because, whew, really had to coach myself through that. And we came up with something that sounds dead up like a raven. There but you go. I would not have had the confidence to be like, yes, I can do this if I had not been goofing around on my own time. And I think that's how we're going to summarize this is that 
a good voice actor it always has the confidence to play the fool, always has the confidence to just go way OTT, over the top, because until you know where that ceiling is, you don't know what's on the ladder rungs between where you are and where that yeah. ceiling is. And some of those things, to, to cut a long story short, some of those things will pay bills. Yeah, we're playing pretend. It's so right? easy for us to take this very seriously because we're adults and we have bills to pay, but wah, we're wah, literally wah, wah, wah. playing pretend. <laughs> and yeah, and it's our job. I mean, how cool is that? Yeah. No, unquestionable. All right, let's jump over to a few questions here. So um, th this is going to be directed, part of them is going to be directed at Morgan, the director, and part of them is going to be directed at Morgan, the voice actor. Okay. And we'll probably be able to suss it out as we go along. Uh, so uh, my Discord user, Michael Cole, says, a big part of our job as voice actors is auditioning. How do you maximize your chances of having your audition heard and making a great impression on a casting director? That is... Put your casting director hat on, Morgan. What what from people gets you to listen to them? And my question, my seasoning on this is, mm. how do you get somebody to listen to your whole demo mm. and not the first mm. 10 seconds only? Mm. Yeah. Woo boy. I mean, listen, every, every casting director functions differently. Some of them, you know, are putting out copy that is too long. I would be surprised if they were listening to the whole thing. And if they do, listening to all the, all the auditions must take them days. Um, I have a follow-up question that nests into that yeah. perfectly. So please yeah. press so, on. So some of some of it may not be about you, right? Just to, you know, give yourself permission not to not to feel so um, stressed about are they gonna listen to the whole thing. Right. Um, I would say overwhelmingly, and this this applies to people who are even represented by some of the top agencies, certainly in Los Angeles and in the country, maybe even the world, do your script analysis. Oh, yes. I had a really contentious post on the subreddit a <laughs> few months back. Um, I, haven't I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> um, there is a TikTok that you can find on my on my feed. I'm at Morgan B. Keaton. Link um, below. Mm-hmm. So it is it is there uh, and I'm happy to to point it out if you can't find it. But basically I don't hear so many actors letting me letting me hear through their voice where they are, what it smells like there. Is it cold? Where is the other person in relation to you? Who are you talking to? How do you feel about them? Do you yeah. like them? What are you physically doing in the scene? You know, and, and guess what? It's probably not, you know, specifically if we're talking about character work, you're probably not doing the same thing the whole time. Maybe you're digging a hole at one point. Maybe you put it in the ground and you're leaning on it for a while. Maybe you swing it over your shoulder and walk in a circle. I mean, get, like play the movie out in your head. Get all of those details clear because you that makes the difference. That is what makes it compelling. It it does. And it's one of those special spices in a read that, again, I'm a, I'm a Jungian kind of by trade, and I truly, truly believe that those things come through to the subconscious mind of the listener or the viewer, and if it's not there... It's it's flat. It's airless. Um, and I imagine that you and I probably also share something to one degree or another, and that is we're big on gesticulation. Mm -hmm. We're big on moving our bodies mm -hmm. when we're voice acting. Obviously, if I'm doing a spot to get somebody to go to the latest Toyota dealership, probably not so much. But as you said, if I'm some coal miner and I'm slinging a pickaxe over my shoulder do this because not only does that change your read in your head, it also changes the posture of your body and the proximity effect. Mm -hmm. And it gives that read mm -hmm. more movement. Mm -hmm. And that's reality yeah. at the mic. Some, I'm a huge fan of that. And some of it, some of it is how it reads to us as far as like, oh, I'm hearing them moving. I'm hearing their body in a different position, et cetera. But also a lot of what that script analysis is serving is making you believe what you're doing which therefore yeah. makes it much better. I mean, I'm a big proponent. I will always have like a at, le at the very least a noiseless pen and what I mean by noiseless is like this yep. is not a great example. It makes a little bit of of a noise when I'm clicking it around, but 
you know, if I have a bow and I'm pulling an arrow, just having something in my hand yep. allows me to to grab onto that a lot more. And, yep. and and just just to really hammer this home, take it to the nth degree. I mean, it I I had I had a round of auditions where the first scene was at a at a political rally where this person is making a big speech and 80% of the auditions that I got for this character were like my fellow citizens this is very important Oof. where I'm looking for like my fellow citizen right you know I'm looking And you got to go you got to you got to go Bob Dole with them you got you know um and you're right because that those little changes in posture really change the way the voice presents itself even if you're not up at you know high volume but getting down into the character when generally what we're doing is all audio we don't have our audience doesn't have the benefit of video they don't have the benefit of a page in front of them mm -hmm. so we have to put them there our job is to make the recording be as immersive as possible and you can't be immersive if you're not doing the thing mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I absolutely 100% agree. I'm totally switching track on you because we said we put it in here. You, my dear friend, are cut of the same cloth as I am. And that is all power to the USB microphone. <laughs> um, how many of us started out with mm. a USB microphone of one kind or another? Mm. We agree that trashing USB mics is needless gatekeeping. What I kind of want to know from you, though, is what was your path tech-wise? Tech and m most importantly, what was the place where you felt that it was useful to jump ship into something different other mm. than something like a USB mic? Mm -hmm. So I would say, um, for better or worse, my response is going to be highly tailored to the fact that I live in Los Angeles. I was going to point that out because I've had other L.A. actors mm -hmm. on my show who to this day are still using USB microphones and making hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. So having having ranted that rant, um, yeah, go, go ahead. Yes. You're an so L.A. actor. I'm an L.A. actor, which means um, I... And, 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 and many times... If the client is not booking the studio, I will book a studio. There's a studio that's very close to me. They charge a $50 client rate or a $25 talent rate to get oh, a man. booth for an hour. Oh, that's stupid reasonable. It's oh, my so God. It's so easy. Um, and the quality is going to be much better than anything that I you know, would have had at the time. And I don't have to worry about traffic, et cetera. I mean, again, I live in a city. So right. not only does that mean that there are more in-person sessions um, available to me as an option, but it also means that there's a lot of city noise here. Um, so way back in the day when I was coaching with Pat Fraley, he mm. recommended the Samson C01U. It was like oh, yeah. this big. Mm -hmm. Big honk and mic. Um, and that was, I mean, that was over 10 years ago. Um, yeah, but that that was, I mean, to his credit, that was actually a really good microphone. <laughs> I think I still have it. Somewhere. There you go. <laughs> we we throw no microphones away in this business. Yeah, I think I still have it. Um, so then uh I was actually gifted this microphone. It's the Ooh. Apogee mic. Not the mic yep. plus. This is an old no, microphone. Just the original Apogee. Yeah, I have. Um, I have a friend who had some. Uh, she was in a relationship between the two of them. There was just a ton of extra, uh, extra equipment, and she was. Like, you you you, want this. you benefited from them crashing their worlds together. I sure did. Okay. Um, yeah, and to be frank with you, this booth you see around you is days old to me. Um, this was just delivered to me a few days ago. Wow. What What are you driving? No, this is um, it's an old model, but this is a uh, an LA vocal booth. So it's a four by oh, six, a sure. tier two um, uh, padding, you know, insulation situation. There's right. actually a window behind here too. Is are you is that the model with the floated floor or not? I believe it is floated. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's a great product. I found it used. Whew, I was I was right? committed to buying a new one. I love their colors, um, but this <laughs> because that comes through in the read. <laughs> Listen, if you're going to be I... taking up four by six feet in my living room, damn it right be you cute. should be okay to it look at it. Should be easy on the eyes. I agree. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so so that that is to say, my uh, my XLR mic, I just kind of didn't see the point. I moved recently as well. I didn't mm. see the point of setting this up in my closet. And so this was easier for me to pull out the Aperture sure. mic. And I will tell you, I will tell you right now, we were, um, before this, we were talking about a plugin that we both use um, and love. Oh, I'll, I'll say Bruce Furry out loud. Hey, hey, Cleve Grant, if you guys see me, call me, okay? Yeah, well, that good. Yeah, so, so I recorded an audition. I had a friend in town. My, uh, my client, who I've worked with many times, gave me one of, you know, many lottery auditions I've gotten over the years. He was like, hey, this is one line. Can you record this three to five times for me? Right. And, uh, you know, down to the wire, I recorded it uh, real quick on this USB mic. I ran uh, Bruce Free over it, sent it in. Like a week or two later, I kid you not, he said, Morgan, invoice me this amount of money. They used my audition <laughs> for this audi for, for the spot. Okay. I will say I will say at least at least four times at the beginning of my full time career, people used my audition takes that were done on USB microphones, and I wasn't even on something as good as an Apogee. I was on a blue snowball. Mm -hmm. I was on a used snowball. Uh, it, it really does go to show you that you just don't know sometimes, and it's not a problem until it is. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like I mean, did you ever? As a curiosity, did you ever get somebody coming back co saying something about your USB mic audio quality? Not once. No, I did. I did two characters. They even brought me back for a second character on a video game that I recorded on this in a worse space than this. There you go. In literally a closet. It's um, not a thing, people. It's not a thing. Judge the microphone, not the connector. And okay? they're getting and, better every day. Oh, they're God, yeah. I'm going to actually be doing uh, one of my next uh, booth camp videos is going to be uh, comparing a couple other USB microphones. Because unlike back in the day where arguably they did have some QC issues... Mm -hmm. Those are kind of gone now, and it, you know, I I I won't show it. I'll, actually, I guess I'll show it here. You know, I'm surrounded by a ton of clutter, and I've got a billion cables. Mm -hmm. um, there's something legitimately mm -hmm. attractive about having one less thing on your desk. Mm -hmm. So I I just for all the USB mic haters out there, we're telling you maybe pick another hill to die on because this one's no longer available. And this all right? this travels great as well. Um, sure, that's a pretty low-profile setup. It's real small. Um, yeah. What I would say got me to switch, because uh, I'm, 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 I've been trying to think while we've been talking about this. I think part of it is that I'm getting more into session singing, and so I needed something mm -hmm. a little bit more robust for that. Okay. Um, also, the idea be behind getting the SM7B is because it is historically a drum mic, Yep. It does very well in loud environments. And my last yes. apartment was on a main street. Ooh. So I figured, you know, this was going to do the best for me to get as much of that noise out as possible. And yeah, as, as a former studio rat and second engineer, uh, I was known, I had two beat to hell SM7Bs that I would always mic kick drums with because they they have such good rejection. But they're also, if you give them the right amount of gain, they're damn hard to clip mm -hmm. you can really belt into that and i mean mm -hmm. you know if you were if you're a gen x person or, or like me or somebody who was uh big into the smashing pumpkins pretty much every single vocal of the mm. smashing pumpkins you hear is billy corgan singing into an og mm -hmm. sm7 which is just an sm7b with a slightly larger capsule in it mm. so um more questions um it's and this piggybacks on uh, our discussion of auditioning. Uh, my my friend High King uh, out in the Netherlands says, uh, sometimes the audition script seems so long, it's possibly the whole script. How much would you read for the audition and how do you kind of make the decision if you're going in there with a set of scissors or scalpels? How do you make the decision what mm. to what part of it to use? I'm of a few minds about this question. You know, I, I, I think that some of it, some of it, can have to do with the genre. Some of it can have to do with the casting director and their priorities and their experience level and and all of that. You know, again, I've I've gotten character work auditions that are where my 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 resulting audition has been like four minutes long. Mm -hmm. You know, who is going to listen to all of that? Like, I, I hope you do. Um, That's always the eternal hope. <laughs> you know. 
so so you know what I will say overall is sometimes the casting director is just going to know and if they're really in a time crunch they will know if your vo- if the voice print is what matters you know for example it, you know I've most recently been casting dubbing and so that's what keeps coming to mind mm-hmm. I have to pick not only a great fit for the character and a great actor etc but I also need to choose a voice that realistically is going to be coming out of out of that face it's a little you know more it's a little narrower of a selection in dubbing, but the same the, the same thing applies to um, video games and to animation. You have a character design, and that voice reasonably has to be, you know, has to make sense coming out of that body. So sometimes you hear it, and it's just like there's no way. Usually, what I will do still, because there are always more roles to cast, is I will listen to the whole thing regardless of if that person sounds like they're a fit or not, because I may be able to use them somewhere else. And yeah, I, fit them somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, and I would hope that that applies to other casting directors. You know, with, with something like commercials or industrials that are moving at a much faster clip, Yeah, probably they're not going to listen to the whole thing. Agreed. The longest copy that I've seen outside of character work is probably industrials and those are the ones that i really don't have like an answer i go to every time um i would say mm, i mean in the world of ai it's so difficult oh, it's so you, difficult you're I, i'm warning you right now you're going to come back on in the future for us to talk about that because i'm over it right now all i've been able to do yeah. for the last six months is talk about it but continue i'm sorry yeah the the, the historical <laughs> advice from people wiser than me has been do the whole copy Mm -hmm. just do it and and this may not apply as much to like i don't have i don't have experience on cast and call club i don't have experience on fiverr i don't have recent experience on voice one two three where there are many clients who are less experienced or maybe untoward or whatever it may be Mm -hmm. so i i cannot speak to that and that is my caveat here but acting in a bit more of a you know uh, mainstream sort of voiceover sense, right. probably just do all of the copy. Um, yeah. If it is excessively long, I've even seen this with video games sometimes. Um, okay, and I see this you know, in conversations with my, with my colleagues as well. Like there is no cut and dried answer. Sometimes I will cherry pick and just give them a few because they're going to hear mm. it and they're going to know. Right. You know, I've always, and I've spent, you know, I've got about uh, two thirds of a foot in the voice acting realm and about a third of a foot in things like industrial. I do a lot of IVR voicemail, Mm -hmm. uh, things like that, where, I mean, if somebody's sending you a a demo script or an audition script for IVR voicemail, number one, that's weird because what are they going to do? Send you a list of other people's names. Mm. Um, But when it comes to voice acting specifically, I typically tell people you've got the 10, 30, 60 rule. 10 seconds is what they're going to listen to, and that's going to be to identify your voice, your Mm -hmm. vocal tone. Mm -hmm. And if they get past that, from that point to the 30-second mark, they're listening for your flow, diction, intonation, pronunciation, and enunciation. If they listen all the way to 60 seconds, which should be for a commercial demo, that's the time out. Uh, if they're listening to 60 seconds, they're listening for acting. Mm-hmm. They're listening for your emotion and how you inhabit the copy. Not necessarily the character, because generally mm-hmm. speaking, at that point, you're not privy to the character. But you got the copy in front of you, and copy is something that you can inhabit. And as you went to bat on Reddit, um, you should be doing some work with that copy. You should be figuring out the 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 the, the, the undercurrent of what's being said. What's the message? What's the immediate message and the overall message. Is this a call to action or is this an inspirational thing? And mm-hmm. those kinds of things. So what what it does bring down to though, and this is another question, what is the process or the extra considerations does a casting director make for worldwide talent? This comes from my friend Colin Morrison. Um, what have you in, in what have you come across by way of foreign talent? And I know you're you're multilingual. You speak Japanese. I do. Is that correct? Yeah. So, have you had experience with working? I don't know, for lack of a better word, outside our our United States bubble. And 
is there something by way of demo mm. where you can I don't know flex your international credentials? Is that a thing? Mm -hmm. I, I, what are your What are your thoughts? I would say I have I have no qualms working with anybody anywhere as long right. as you know as long as whatever laws in place or you know whatever <laughs> whatever that is that is not my area of expertise um but sure. as long as like technically everything works then great um i go to the agencies here who do represent people all over and i also go to different casting lists so i would definitely recommend you know finding different casting databases people are creating them all the time um get on get on those because people are looking at them um I would say you probably want to demonstrate um, as much facility as you have with accents, with different styles of acting, um, with different different degrees of accents as well. I mean, often we're looking to worldwide talent for that authenticity of an accent or of a cultural experience or background, um, even of an area of, of expertise um, where you need to have certain experience with vocab or, or whatever yeah, it may be. Yeah, fluencies in technical terms and things like that. Right. So, you know, yeah. if, if, we're, if we're talking about, say, a German talent, right, probably what I would be looking for in your demo is like, can you give me a super German accent? Can you give me a partially German accent? Can you do any others? Can you do an American accent? Um, yeah, a, a German American transplant accent, things yeah. like that, because those are all actual. Those are things that you know directors look for. Right, and not to say that any one of those things is required. Maybe you just have a really German accent and you cannot change it. That probably is still going to be ultimately what leads me to you is that I'm looking for someone with a really German accent. However, the way that you keep me interested and open up your uh, your future opportunities is by having even more facility there. Yeah, showing breadth, breadth of ability. Mm -hmm. um, I, I completely agree. Uh, we're running on time here. I want to finish off, though, with a combo question from both uh, my Discord user, Late Night Mark, and combined with uh, my friend Dustin, and that is... How do you get into a loop group? And uh, where are, Dustin asks, where are places that you go looking for loop groups and loop group work? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's what's the path in? Aside from DIY, obviously, which is right. valid, but. Right, which is exactly what I did. I started right, my exactly. group after seeing a listing on Craigslist looking for a non-union loop group. I was like, I There you go. <laughs> um, so don't discount that. However, with that said, I just want to to validate that even for people in Los Angeles, even well-established actors, they don't know how to get in either. It is made <laughs> to be difficult. It is made to be, you know, like very closed it, off. It is very La Cosa Nostra. It is yes. this thing that we do and between I, each other. I can't speak to non-union work, but union looping it really pays, and that is part of why they don't talk about it. Right. Um, so, just, just, to, just to validate all of that off the bat, I would say, look for, and, 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 and also, again, I know that most of your talent, many people watching are going to be remote. Most of um, loop groups are done in person. Yeah, are physical. And, and Walla as well. Like the way that you are going, mm -hmm. your most likely way to get in is going to be through voice matching, which which is that dialogue replacement we were talking about earlier. Those right. are the jobs that go through agencies where they say, hey, we're looking for somebody who sounds exactly like Andrew Scott. Yeah. And then, you know, people send in their auditions. That is the way that you get in. That is the way that you learn who the wranglers are for the big loop groups. And that means that you probably do need a rep. Because those those auditions are not unless it is highly specialized. Like we're looking for somebody who speaks Swahili. Or and, yeah, and and the director has come up dry time and time and time yes. again. Yeah. Then they'll throw it out for public consumption and try to increase a little bit of outside the bubble visibility. Right. But you're absolutely right. It is kind of a closed system. It is kind of its own insular culture, mm -hmm. and it's hard to get a foot in. And and some of the groups. Some of the groups, and there are more now than there were when I started my group in 2012. So you mm -hmm. have more of a chance of finding a way in. They will offer classes. And I will say, 
it's not like the the help network, sound on studios, voice actors network. They're not they don't I don't notice those classes going to these bigger schools that really are doing all the marketing about them. If you want to find one of these classes, you need to locate what groups are offering classes and follow yes. them closely. Get on their mm-hmm. mailing list, get on their social media, put on notifications for their stuff and see when they're teaching next. Yeah, and be a good participant in that Facebook group or in that subreddit um, where when you when you do learn that something, that there's a meeting happening that's an open call meeting where they're including more people, show up and be ready, um, but not in the way that you might think. Don't be the guy with your business card out. Don't be the guy, you know, with a memory stick saying, here's my, no, be there. And uh, really one of the best ways to engender yourself into that group and that community is say, what can I do? What can I do? And you might be told, well, we're just going over some stuff tonight. So, you know, your participation and being here is great. Leave it at that. But mm-hmm. then keep going back. We mm-hmm. come back around to that connection and to that community. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's what gets things done. That's what moves you forward. And there are so many different ways in this today modern world where you can connect but you got to be a little bit of johnny or jenny on the spot with it and be proactive about Mm -hmm. it because yeah it's great when something finds you but until something finds you you should be ready willing and able to go out and find those avenues of opportunity that gets you in to that culture so so and 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 don't make the mistake either of not seeing your class and uh, for for what it can be to you. It's easy to look at taking a class or a workshop um, as what you are getting out of the person who is offering it. But part of what you are paying for is the opportunity to meet those other people. Yeah. You know, if you vibe with them, find like I, either in the chat, you can say, hey, if anybody wants to connect, here's my information or look them up on social media later. If they don't want to connect, then obviously leave it be. But, you know, that they may be the ones who get offered a chance to get into a group before you do, and they may have some tips for you. And they're going to be in that group to reach out the bubble when the time is right 100%. and bring somebody else in. Mm-hmm. So it, you know, it kind of is a who you know thing that we do. But, uh, you know, again, I went for a long time when I started out just being my own dude and not having to, you know, rely on connections. But you would be dramatically mistaken in thinking to think that I am wholly and totally self-made. I am not. I benefit from my connections with other VO educators and content creators to come on shows like this. What what has happened between you and I? We met because I'm a Reddit moderator of a voice uh, channel on Reddit, and... We totally, we vibed. We were just like, wow, no, that's a great explanation you just gave. Of course, I'm going to pass that on to the group. Mm -hmm. That's how progress often happens. Mm -hmm. And anytime you can make this easier, do it. Do what it takes, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, Let's wrap up and do the whole social media thing. Where can people find you, Morgan? Where is the place for you to be looking when you're looking for the Morgan Keaton so I, I would say I'm three different people, depending on which platform you're on. So you may like Fair more enough. on one than another. Um, <laughs> I am active on Instagram, uh, on on TikTok, and also on uh, on Twitter. I am Morgan B. Keaton on all of those. You're at Morgan B. Keaton on all Morgan of them? B. Keaton. Right on. Unify your handles. Cl- Make it the same across all platforms. <laughs> if you can, uh, yeah, if your name is that available. Uh, sure. I always get, I, I unfortunately uh, get mixed up with the sexy priest from Fleabag. <laughs> yeah, well, it's okay. I, I have a deep respect for that Andrew Scott as well. He's mm-hmm. one of my favorite actors. There will be no other Moriarty in my mind than Andrew Scott. He's great. Um, w- and what's your, what's your primary website where people can go in the event that there is a casting director out there and there are a few of them who are interested in the fabulous Morgan Keaton. Where can they go on the webs? It is morgankeaton.com. So that's my one shortcoming. (laughs) Not Morgan B. Keaton. (laughs) Couldn't get the B in there. Morgan, thanks so much for coming on Booth to Booth with me today. And uh, again, you're going to be back because I just really dig getting a chance to talk to you. Thanks so much for having me. 
And again, everybody else, all our links are down in the description thingy below. Do us a favor, like, click, subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so on Ko-fi. That information is down below as well. But until next time, everybody, this is Andrew Scott. That is Morgan B. Keaton. And this is Booth to Booth. We'll see you later, everybody. Bye-bye. From the beautiful Pacific Northwest, this has been Booth to Booth with Andrew Scott. Booth to Booth is a narrow band broadcast network production in association with andrewscottmedia.com. Andrew Scott, executive producer. Our theme music was written and produced by Ron Kajawa. Website design and maintenance by Vacano Creative. Christopher Vacano, webmaster. Available at vacanocreative.com. Audio and video production by Andrew Scott. Available at andrewscottmedia.com. Got topic ideas, questions, or comments for the show? Email us at patchin at booth2booth.com or by simply clicking the link in the description. On behalf of host Andrew Scott, I'm Eric Murray. From our booth to yours, thanks for joining us. See you next time on Booth to Booth. NBBN. The focus is on you.